Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I'm here with Meher Roy. Today, we're speaking with Stani, who is um, the founder of Ava Companies, the company, the company unsurprisingly, behind Ava, um, which we covered a while back, and also Social Network Lens, which we will speak about today. Stani, welcome back. Thanks, thanks for having me here again, Frederick. This is uh, it's, it's always great to be here. Cool. We had you um, on not so long ago. Um, then we spoke about Ava V3, very tangentially. We, I think we mentioned Lens, um, but today we're here to kind of make up for that shortcoming. So, Sunny, in a nutshell, what is Lens? Tell us about the origin story um, and uh, what it set out to do. I remember something very vaguely about you applying to be kind of the, the Twitter CEO. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was uh, becoming a self-claimed uh, Twitter uh, CEO while while there was a big chaos going on everywhere. Um, obviously, that was a joke, but somehow people really thought about that. That's actually happening, which I can imagine being a CEO of Twitter. Um, but yeah, that was fun. And Lens itself is a um, set of smart contracts and, and tools that allow you to build Web3 social um, applications or make your your uh, application Web3 social. And what it means that um, you can create things like um, Web3 powered handles, uh, profiles, um, ability to collect content as well and make content available uh, in the future. So something that's missing now in um, all this kind of like an internet social applications is that these platforms are run by businesses, um, you know, and they can go down at some point. And we, we the people, we um, create a lot of these internet artifacts. And, and if these platforms are going down, we lose all those interesting, culturally relevant um, artifacts that we create online. So in, in a nutshell, it's basically a set of different tools that solve different challenges, um, owning your audience, having ownership for that, um, having ability to store your content in a decentralized uh, storage um, and other kind of uh, um, other uh, primitives we, we call. So it, it doesn't solve one particular uh, challenge that um, someone might have or want to use Web3 Social, but actually solves multiple of those uh, things. And it really depends on what uh, developers are building. So what of those primitives they actually want to use to solve their problem. So it can be as simple as um, adding a collect button into a blog post, you know, for by lens or um, adding profiles or a follow graph to your existing um, Web3 application or even traditional application. Okay, kind of, I see why um, there are some aspects of social networks um, where you feel uncomfortable with um, them being owned by companies. So tell us how Lens functions. So you said it's a set of smart contracts, but kind of who's written those smart contracts? Are they upgradable? Who has admin rights? So who do they effectively belong to someone? Yeah, it's a good question. So obviously at this stage, Lens protocol, um, I mean, we hit a couple of months ago a milestone um, of uh, being one year on online actually so we've, we've been building for two years now uh one year live and still beta so basically um we're launching a v2 which is an improvement of what we had our first vision of what lens could actually be and bringing more flexibility into what could be built in terms of the smart contract itself um uh, there's different things that actually provide uh immutability for example the ownership of your profile so that always belongs to you. But certain features are still under upgradability and mainly because it's very early. Um, there is kind of like a soft governance at, at this point. So we introduced uh, two months ago um, uh, LIBS, short for uh, Lens Improvement Proposals. And they're there for actually uh, soft polling for the developer community and in overall the Lens community, how the protocol could be evolved different kinds of uh, improvements that could be made. Um, but it's part of the whole uh, process of progressively decentralizing as the protocol gets more uh, mature. Um, 
in what ownership actually means is um, I want to pinpoint that is um, we have this concept about uh, crypto in general that once you have your keys, um, you own the assets that are on, on that key. So we simply extend that idea, not only covering, let's say, your crypto uh, assets, but also the profile that you're using ongoing basis to um, communicate with other people and establish connections over uh, Lens protocol or wherever you are integrating Lens. Stanley, is it correct to view Lens as a developer platform for social media applications, meaning, meaning that Lens itself is not thinking of the sort of end user interface or uh, the end user format in which content might be delivered, but rather it's, it seeks to be one layer below where it provides a lot of primitives through which people could build, I don't know, Twitter light clone or or any, any any clone essentially of a social media application or an entirely new social media application. Yeah, I, I mean, in the beginning, what we wanted to establish, our, our very early vision was that um, we have quite a good conviction of, let's say, uh, what social media builders need uh, to build um, and what could be built on, on, or with Lens, actually. In the very beginning, that there was a lot of discussion for the past couple of years about the existing platforms and um, the lack of um, user ownership, um, things like, for example, owning your handle or owning the relationships that you create with, with, with your audience, for example, from creator perspective or any user perspective. Um, and also the, the idea that um, how we can avoid, for example, censoring in, in certain uh, scenarios. So how we can build more equitable uh, social media networking uh, behavior. So in that sense, kind of, uh, we noticed that a lot of the applications were tuning into rhythm-based content. So if you look at the current the Lens ecosystem, most of the applications are heavily relying on uh, written text. We also have some applications that are focusing also um, on audio and, and video, but they really are trying to solve existing kind of um, applications and making them just more Web3 uh, powered. And I think that's fine. Um, but for what it, what, it, what we think is exciting is um, if we can, with Lens, enable the new experiences. So what if because of Lens, it's more easier to build Web3 social, um, meaning that as a developer um, or social media founder, you don't need to focus necessarily on rebuilding a network, but you could actually tap into a shared network um, or have the flexibility to also create a new network if, if that's what you see as, as valuable. So the way I like to com compare Lens uh, protocol and, and, and the vision is, is similar to um, something like Ethereum and many of the protocols uh, in DeFi that, or maybe on the underlying networks where you pro provide uh, infrastructure for um, and design space for uh, developers, uh, creators, and everyone to innovate. And the more you have that design space, you will see that innovation coming. So we basically have taken a couple of steps forward and trying to guide and, and think what kind of things could be built on Lens. And today we have taken like 180 degrees back and thinking like, how we can actually be less involved and how we actually can create more space for developers to build those um, new experiences and make the protocol less and less opinionated and more and more open. And that's, for example, some of the features that are coming in, in the Lens V2 actually opens a new surface for compatibility. So Lens protocol, Lens applications talking to or interacting with the other protocols build on the same um, network. I'd like to take the analogy of Lens protocol being an Ethereum-like substrate on which lots of different social media applications can flower a little bit further. So I was around in crypto when the Ethereum white paper came out uh, in 2013. And 
to me like vitalik's vitalik's genius was he saw a lot of different things that people were trying to build like master coin counterparty counterparty wasn't there yet master coin was the main thing colored coins and master coin and other applications that people were imagining and he was able to come up with a primitive a gas consuming virtual machine the ethereum virtual machine during complete gas consuming virtual machine the ethereum virtual machine as a technical solution saying if we had this primitive all of these application developers would be enabled at once so you had to build just one thing and it would enable a huge di- diverse group of developers when i hear about lens when i hear about your your vision it's almost like my skeptical mind says i don't think there is something like a turing complete virtual machine equivalent for social media that if i build this primitive it's going to satisfy a wide range of social media application developers in my mind it feels every social media application developers needs to be quite different quite heterogeneous and one primitive at the infrastructure level or two primitives at the infrastructure level won't be able to hit diverse needs so convince me otherwise that actually something like that it's possible Yeah that's actually um quite fascinating because that's exactly where we've um, come along so we started in a way where we're thinking that you know each and every social media application has this particular uh set of features or uh behavior so we we basically can offer this as a protocol and something that we learned quite even even just by building and developing and getting feedback from different developers um and watching the the user behavior and and how these applications are built is that this social media landscape is is very wide um and offering a a, a kind of like a protocol wide solution is always going to be quite difficult because it comes as a package and what we noticed is that certain um social media applications in most cases they might have similar features so they might have for example uh profiles uh follow graphs but then when you go to text based applications then you have publications and publication might have sub features as well um and then a bunch of other things that that might different so and that's the beauty of social so the the, the more wider the space is the more innovation uh we we can see and what we realized is that um offering more of like a package um protocol is actually quite difficult and and what actually works better is that we basically slice up the protocol and all the primitives that we have so the things how we humans behave um socially so what are those things that we do uh not only on the internet but outside of the internet how do we form social capital or um let's say relationships how do we produce content how do we distribute content as well and putting those into separate categories and offering them as primitives and and the key here is that um a developer can actually choose what you need from that primitive stack uh that is web3 powered because some of the um elements of your social application doesn't need to be on the blockchain or doesn't need to necessarily require data availability but some do depending on what is the use case and i think that's the kind of like a uh important thing there so we have to figure out the existing primitives and i think we we kind of know them we kind of see that you know here is the different primitives that social media applications are using but i think there is even like a bigger um area to learn of what we can actually do with web3 because we're for example using the blockchain the ability to create digital scarcity or using the timestamp machine um and how do we kind of create new primitives and i think that's the most exciting part of my work where uh we're looking kind of like more in the future and trying things out and and seeing 
what are these primitives that could actually be very empowering for builders to create new, new applications. Can you walk us through these primitives? So, I mean, the obvious kind of, the obvious first example would kind of be like a trust graph. Yes. And that's kind of the thing that probably definitely should be on chain if anything is going to be on chain. And then kind of walk us through the other things that kind of you have identified as social primitives. I think the trust graph or social graph is is an excellent example. So one of one interesting idea about the trust graph, for example, is that you normally when you build a social media application, you you use a database and you usually have your user base. And those users aren't publicly visible where the users, right? But when you're using a uh, Web3 powered uh, social graph, that user base is actually public. Um, and what's interesting there is that you can tap into that public and shared uh, user graph as well. And for, for example, that if you create a, a new experience and you want to get everyone on Lens to, to use it, it's quite simple to, to enable a sign-in with Lens, uh, meaning that you log into that application and if you have a Lens profile, you can, as a, as a builder, you can invite those uh, users. So that mitigates the idea of cold start uh, problem. And then there's kind of a layers of, of social graph and also layers of interest graph. So you could look into the blockchain and see that, okay, what are people doing there? Uh, what are the social behavior or ownership factors that could actually be beneficial for my use case? And you can invite someone who has a lens profile, but also have a specific um, categories of NFTs as well, because that might flag the interest that you have on chain verified data and to use um, your application. So I find this part of um, social graph uh, fascinating because it brings a uh, new concept for, for users, for builders, uh, especially that are haven't used to a shared graph or like a public social graph. Then there is a concept of profiles. Um, and in V1, you have a handle and a profile that are combined together. So each profile has a handle, but on V2, they're separated. So there's a profile NFT uh, that give access to your profile and a handle NFT that is basically a handle. And you can use also a uh, ENS handle if, if you already own that. Um, so handles are a way of identify um, who you as a user are and signal that out. But a profile is a fascinating primitive because um, profiles can follow each other, meaning that you can form relationships um, on chain, meaning that you can actually uh, create an audience. And once you have that audience, you can add programmability. Um, so for example, let's say we have a user that has 100,000 followers. Um, so you can actually share content and ampl amplify content to your own user base, and you can monetize that amplification as well. So um, a creator, for example, can uh, share content of favorite brands and also get automatically monetized. So I would say that one of the key, um, even like, um, I would not even say a primitive, but maybe like a wider building function is that you, you have with Web3 the programmability, but also the, the built-in monetization um, as well. And then there is more Web3 native kind of uh, primitives like collect. So if you want to add a collect button into your blog post um, or you want to make your piece of content, whether that's music or audio or video, um, a tokenized asset and, and make it memorable and collectible, you can still do that um, as well. And with V2, um, obviously there's uh, plenty of features, but the idea of open actions, um, it basically opens up to create any kind of a primitive um, to work with Lens protocol. So you could create a uh, post that appears in your followers feed and it describes a, a DAO, for example, you recently joined um, and you can ask other people to join the same DAO. And instead of seeing uh, a like button, um, or a collect button, you might see a join DAO button instead. And that happens um, completely on chain. So, so basically, what's fascinating here is that these primitives, they don't need to work in silo. 
but they can actually work together with other protocols and primitives that are already built and designed uh, in, in Web3 on the same network or cross-chain with oracles. Is feed generation something that you think of in uh, of a primitive? So basically, when when I think of Twitter, which is kind of the the main social network that I use, um, you kind of you have two views to kind of see your feed, right? The for you, so basically, where it's kind of um, somehow uh, where, where posts are somehow prioritized, but you don't know how, and then basically the thing that just shows you everything in order, and both of them are kind of crappy. So okay. kind of I think uh, to at least for me. I would actually be willing to kind of pay for more diversity in um, feed generation. Is this something that um, could be implemented on top of Lens? Yeah, so obviously this is something that the, can be solved on the application level or services layer. Um, there is one application that is, um, it's an open source uh, front end for, for the Lens protocol, which is, Lenser, um, it's it's built in a in a hackathon in, in two weeks, but progressively has become kind of a place to see integrations between Lens and other uh, Web3 primitives. And something interesting is that there's a um, company called Karma Tree Labs, and they're actually doing uh, algorithms. And those algorithms are available on on the Lenser uh, feed. And I'm I'm pretty sure um, all the other applications there implementing their own algorithms, or you will start seeing actually service providers coming and building those algos similar to, to, to the um, Karma Tree Labs. And what is fascinating is that you can just select an algorithm and, and basically based on that, you, you will see the content. So what is mind blowing here is that normally as a internet user, you know, you're always forced into some particular experience. And this is also related not to social media, but pretty much anything that, that is on the internet. Um, and obviously DeFi changed that a bit because you can move your liquidity easily, exchange your experience to something else. But when it comes to social, being able to actually use third-party algorithms seems kind of a cool idea and, and gives the user choice. So in some ways, I, I think even those algorithms are in, in some ways primitives or, or some sort of uh, components that are built on top that could be reusable as well. Or they can be even uh, private. But the, the biggest difference here is that because the way Lens is built, um, the user has the choice. So you, you can make that availability for user to choose what algorithms you want to use. And if that experience isn't satisfying, the user can go to another application where there is that more better experience. So we've kind of talked about things that should be on chain. Um, I am sure there's many th many parts that are kind of by default off chain. Um, can you talk about those and how they are handled? I think also we have one comp one kind of like a layer between on chain. So just to give an example, how the on chain part works is that um, you can transact on chain. So you can um, you can collect, for example, content as an NFTs. That will be a on-chain transaction, but the actual content is reflected to a decentralized storage or the data availability layer like RB or IPFS. And then, if you don't want to do an on-chain transaction, which is most of the cases, so if you have a you know funny comment that you want to add to a post, um, but you don't see the value of actually tokenizing that um, and, and make it more memorable you could actually use a service we created, which is called Momoka. So Momoka basically allows um, to take content and create it and submit it into data availability layers. And what it means is that when we think about blockchain, the way it's built today, it has execution, it has a state and, and data availability. And what in some cases you need for content is only the data availability, but you don't need necessarily like the execution part. So you just want to ensure that the content is stored as a internet artifact for longer period of time. It's it's something we don't think about often, but like let's say if if, if a popular blogging platform goes down today, what happens to all the artifacts that we all created that are very important today uh, for us? So you can use data availability transactions 
And then the off-chain piece, usually is something that is built on an application level layer. So currently there are likes, but you can build, for example, uh, privacy, private posts, um, and, and all the things that you actually don't need on on-chain infrastructure uh, and the programmability and, and that verification that it brings. Um, and it really depends on the use case, what we talked earlier. So um, if you're building a, a publication application, maybe you use some of these primitives like, uh, let's say, profiles, handles, um, then you're using um, Momoka transactions to store the content. Maybe you add a collect button as well to, to later being able to, to, to bring that content on chain as well if you um, want the users to do so. But it really depends on, on the exact uh, use case. And that's why building Web3 Social is very different from anything else I've, I've built before because you really have to bring that optionality for uh, the builders and they essentially choose from what they actually want to use to, to, succeed, to succeed in their use case. What I'm curious about in technical architecture is, is there a tragedy of the commons problem in Web3 Social? What I mean is like, what I mean is this. So, so we have like some, let's say we have some, some primitives and some kind of social graph on a blockchain and then there is a data availability solution which I think in Lens's case is an is an ad three where I think the data can be published. And anyone can come and build a user interface to to all of all of this data. And as Figurica mentioned, have basically their own curation algorithms uh, decide what to show to a user and attract users. And there's a competition between user interfaces to attract users, and hopefully that goes in a direction where more and more users are satisfied. When I imagine this interaction as a builder of an UI, let's say, like, okay, I start a company with I don't know, two co-founders, we're going to build a UI on top of Netflix or Paul. I imagine myself in the beginning building like good curation, good algorithms to filter data well, but as soon as kind of like the first level succeeds, my incentive is to have some feature in which there is locking for the users. For example, if the users want to do a direct message to each other, and that direct messaging system may not naturally fit a blockchain, my incentive is to build like a private data messaging, private DM layer in my user interface and have users message each other in my private DM system so that those users damn get locked in into my, my user interface as opposed to other people's user interface. So in a sense, my selfish incentive is to break interoperability, ship that incremental feature which is not shared on the public graph because it is by having that extra incremental private feature that I lock users onto my user interface and develop a business model by, I don't know, selling attention or something like that. And um, so, in a sense, and if you imagine me as like one developer and there are 10 developers, if the race to the incentive race behaves like that, then actually none of us in the end are. Uh, incentivized to bury the public good, which is like this public data lake of of social data. So maybe one other analogy you can take of it is there's this famous goat herd pasture or tragedy of the commons problem, which is I have my set of goats and other people and another goat herd has a set of goats. Maybe there's ten of us. There's public pasture where the goats can go and graze. But we want to do limited grazing on the public pasture because if you do too much grazing, then the grass dies out, the pasture becomes useless. But my selfish incentive is to graze as much as possible because sort of that's my optimal strategy. And when everybody follows their optimal strategy, well, nobody maintains the public pasture. So do you think there's a problem like that for, for social media where the UI builder's incentives will always 
go towards these private features and your data lake will in the end end up becoming a weak data lake. I, I love that you're already thinking of uh, building something on Lens. Um, <laughs> that's a bit with the example. But um, I, I do think that uh, it's, it's a very, very fascinating topic to, to, to think about because it really isn't only like kind of like a, a talking point on Web3 Social because, well, obviously, I, I, I think that end of the day, it, it really depends on what kind of network effects there exists, right? So, so effectively for uh, new application builders, they might want to go with a, let's say, public uh, shared social graph and, and get the value out of there and then build a delta on top because I personally think that the aspect of decentralization should exist where you create guarantees for the users or for the developers on some sort of objective. So for example, like I would be very fine if Lens Protocol is decentralized, but let's say there's maybe five of um, API services that are making sense of all the data and brings to the users um, or, or applications. As long as there is that endpoint where you can always revert that, hey, you know, I own uh, my profile and, you know, we have a risk of the system not working. And, and, and that's kind of like a removal of the root key is, is where the decentralization comes in. And for when you think about like new builders, for some might actually be that um, they want their own graph. So they look at the, the, the kind of like a public graph and try to make sense of it and, and think that this is good. But what we are aiming for, we want to do it um, in a different way. We want to create completely separate graph, for example, and maybe not making it um, shareable. And that's fine because I do think there should be a, um, a public good layer that exists and then there should be incentive for that, but there's also should be incentives to building even layers that might be more private, but they have the use case. As long as there's that functional public good layer that um, that works. So the same question comes in also in regarding, let's say, uh, Ethereum, why people choose to build on Ethereum today, for example, why they don't just go um, and build on a completely new network that empowers only their users. And a more simple argument now is that, you know, you can always build your layer two, where we saw recently with MakerDAO, for example, looking at Solana's code base and thinking of um, using that to, to build their own uh, network. And, 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 and there's a question like, okay, why, like we have kind of like a similar uh, challenge. And then Lido is another example where, you know, there's a discussions where, uh, there's discussions of thinking of how these validators, uh, staking pool validators could actually self-limit themselves. And I think these limitations um, really isn't servicing because I, I, I think that if, uh, a centralization is a challenge. Uh, we have to innovate in a way where there's enough competition to, to to build towards. In other words, for example, when we go back to the question of the shared social graph, um, the the value there is obviously uh, the data and what you could do with the data and and the user base. So this is the reason why, for example, a new developer wants to build on, let's say, Ethereum. Um, even if the gas cost is a bit higher, because let's say there's a certain amount of users, uh, a network effect, based on those users, we can quantify what are their data. So what kind of holdings they are, um, what kind of behavior, and that creates uh, network effects. So in some ways, I think what might happen um, regardless of like plans and um, regarding even like Ethereum and, and, and similar situations is that you will see traction of, of people coming and building on the same graph and that just empowers the graph and, and obviously makes it better. So there's, in, in, there's incentives as long as the graph grows, but there's also incentives to, to, to build something um, separate and less uh, shareable as well. And they might have those two different use cases. And I do believe, for example, like a public graph shareable works pretty well when you are building applications that are all kind of like a public town squares 
where you can use that public data, public discussions. Um, you want to have data availability there. But then you might want to create an application that is some sort of a members pub, uh, I don't know, for uh, people who have kids, uh, you know, and you have some sort of verification process there and, you know, you want to uh, build it on a separate graph. So that's possible uh, too. So I think that problem exists everywhere, but I think something that really is tied to that is that like liquidity in the data or whether data is liquidity, but basically that's why that's the reason why, for example, people choose to build on Lens or build in overall build on Ethereum uh, as well when gas costs might be cheaper somewhere else. So I do think the problem exists everywhere and it's some sort of uh, balancing aspect of, of incentives that actually gets people to, to build. I hope that's a, that's a, that's a, a answer that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'm actually curious what, what, what the technical architecture looks like for these kind of public goods parts of the Lens protocol. And then the extension of the question would be, okay, if I wanted to build sort of a private good, which is a private DM or a group group chat, private group chat, how, how would people build on top of it? What, what's the tech or on technical architecture of the Lens system? Yeah, I mean, the, the protocol itself is is public good. So basically you will, deci um, you will decide what elements you want to use from Lens. So for example, maybe the only thing you care about is handles and profiles, and then you basically build a database uh, on top for private messages. And then you have encryption as well. And that's actually a good example of a um, good Web3 social application because Web3 social, uh, it doesn't need to be Web3 social from head to the toes. Uh, I mean, in terms of like, every single thing we have to solve with some sort of uh, decentralization aspect because uh, decentralization comes with, with a cost and where there's a cost, there has to be some sort of other incentive value to do that. Handles make sense because you can trade handles, uh, profiles as well because you can secure an audience. Maybe some of them become brands and um, they can be also um, tradable and you can also um, share revenue split uh, revenue between different applications, uh, between different users as well. So I think like we will see in the future very simple technical products built on Lens or with Lens, where you use maybe like one or two primitives. You even use a Lens SDK, so you don't interact with the much of of actual smart contract code base, but through an SDK. And then you add the things that you don't need the, the Web3 part and, and the experience, and, and that's about it. I, I think it's fascinating because um, in most of the interesting things that you can do with social media applications, you have to do it very fast. So you want to build something in a month or two, and whatever you build necessarily won't last long. So we probably will see applications getting a lot of, lot of user acquisition, but then you have very low retention. And I think that's okay. I mean, a social application might become like um, something compared compared to seeing, let's say, movies or other type of content where you know you do it once or twice or uh, maybe three times and that's it. And we've seen this also outside of Web3 social. So, for example, Threads achieved 100 million uh, sign up sign ups very quickly because they did it on a shared network within their own platform and went down to 10 to 8 million and and still um, is decreasing. So. We do see this kind of like a uh, a challenge, and it's just a new way of building, I think, in in this space. And and maybe that eight or tenth application that you build and experience that might have a better uh, retention curve, in and actually start having more stickiness. But if Lens can make that process um, ten times easier and and reactivating already users that are on board and their friends, I think then we're in a in a in a very nice path. How many people have profiles on Lens today? Yes, 120,000 profiles. It's really not a big KPI for us because the access is still in beta. So anyone who wants a profile, you know, you can shoot me, um, shoot me a, um, a DM, for example, or Twitter, 
um, and I can let you in, especially if you're looking to build something. And then down the line, I think Propos is, isn't really uh, the, the best way to measure even when we're in a permissionless state, um, because the actual the, the actual usage depends on the use cases. So I think it goes to the application level. I think we will measure more of some sort of monetization and how it empowers the the the, the actual uh, developers as well, and maybe even the users. I think uh, that might be our approach. So we still are working with the ideas of like what we actually should follow uh, because it's very early. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the reasons why you're in beta and you kind of need an invite to join is um, that uh, your costs per active user are actually pretty high. I, I read somewhere that it's around 400 US dollars per year. And I think kind of the monetization that we scratched like a couple of times now, that's kind of one of the parts that can address that. So how do you see this um, develop in the future? They, 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 so the interesting way is that users always, when they interact with the blockchain, obviously there is gas fees. If the network is on layer twos or let's say something like Polygon, um, those costs are much lower. And the way we actually did the use, the, the way we built the experience um, across all the Lens ecosystem is that as a user, you don't really sign for transactions um, and you don't pay for transactions. So they're sponsored transactions. Uh, on a layer two, for example, the costs are uh, much lower. So you could put them as a as a developer. You basically put those costs into something like your oper operation costs of like AWS and and whatnot. But more recently, uh, a few months ago, when we released uh, Momoka, basically being able to do data availability transactions, um, I think we hit in total six hundred forty thousand transactions uh, with a total cost of. Uh, $200 uh, for all those transactions. So what it means is that instead of doing an on-chain comment or even of uh, an on-chain post, we simply submit those transactions into data availability layer. And why this is radically innovative is that basically when you do um, social media interactions, you don't really need, in most cases, uh, execution state and together with the data availability and, and you can reduce your cost uh, significantly. So the user costs kind of are in the level where the applications can even start sponsoring as long as they cover those uh, costs somehow or they figure a way of either sponsoring or baking into their fees when someone wants to make the, make the content uh, on-chain. So that's, that's a kind of like a big uh, improvement there. Uh, in, in terms of the um, cost associated. And, and this is mainly because also social media data comes in bulk. And what I mean that is that the way the blockchain works is that you have a block time and a certain amount of space you can fill a block. And when it comes to social media uh, execution, um, your data is, is bigger than those blocks. So necessarily like you can't really feed uh, a blockchain in, in the way it works. But you want to use it, for example, when you start creating handles and profiles and securing a follow graph, for example. So it's, it's, it's more about the design choices we made to create an architecture where these costs are mitigated and you still have the features you need for the right um, primitives and, and then the use cases. So what, what would be the updated cost? So basically, if 400 uh, was uh, the cost before Momoka, um, what's the cost per user now? So basically it's 0 0.0003 uh, cents per transaction. So it's quite, you can compare it to something like AWS pretty much. Okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's basically negligible. So why, why haven't you opened it up to the wider public? I, I was always at the end of, under the impression that kind of the cost is, uh, uh, is the largest reason here. Cost isn't the largest for us. Now we, we are currently focusing on um, shipping the version two, uh, which is already going to DevNet. Uh, and what it means is that you can start integrating uh, Lens V2 already into existing applications and start testing out. And, and then obviously the mainnet will follow once uh, things are looking good on, on that side. Um, so maybe then, I mean, we can open up, I think. <laughs> 
Cool. So there's um, one more topic topic that I'd kind of like to cover, and that's governance. You already kind of talked about the um, lens improvements, uh, improvement proposals um, a, a bit ago. Um, and I think this also addresses like part of Meher's question about kind of even Meher creating this kind of lock-in uh, application on top of lens. Um, I mean, it, it's it's pretty clear that as a protocol, you need to be agile enough to kind of react to threats like that. Um, so obviously, you kind of you need some sort of upgradability. How does how does governance work then? Yeah, currently the governance is basically more of a self governance where you have uh, builders coming and raising, for example, ideas that maybe this particular way could be done and differently, or even from our team. So maybe we realize that something needs to be changed. A very recent improvement parts, for example, that we noticed that um, over social media, there's a lot of phishing attempts. And actually, there's increased amount of, of uh, phishing cases where the users are clicking some sort of a link, um, giveaway, and they signed a permit uh, transaction. And, and what happens is that their NFTs are uh, moving out. And this is basically the, the, the whole kind of like a Web3 user base that, that is uh, um, af affected. It's not lens related. But what we noticed is that um, to mitigate this issue, we wanted to create a profile guardian. It means that the profiles are non-transferable until you unlock this uh, profile guardian. And what it actually allowed to do is that we saw a case where one user actually was a victim of a phishing attempt, but the profile guardian saved um, that lens profile, but all the other NFTs were uh, gone. So it's an interesting innovation that we basically did, and we pro we proposed to the community, and there was a discussion about um, you know how it can affect, and and then it was voted in. But down the line, what's uh, important is that as the protocol gets so-called like protocol market fit, so we're still talking about a protocol that is zero to one, so it's not Aave. Aave protocol, you know, it it has its market share and um, that's a different story. But once there's enough actually traction and it becomes um, important for developers to see it, it um, being updated constantly and it has traction, that's where kind of like the, the progressive governance kick in. So what will be the next step to decentralize uh, the governance and what would the step and how to involve the community? And based on my experience with Aave, it's, it's quite a um, lengthy process for sure. How do you see the current decentralized um, socials ecosystem? So, I mean, we, we saw friend.tech uh, emerge like two weeks ago or so and kind of quickly find its place somewhere. Um, then we have Farcaster, Noster, Mastodon, and so on. How do you view that space? I do think like all these initiatives, apps, and protocols, they don't really have yet um, a product market fit. But I do think all these teams are working hard to get something. Um, some are more protocols, like let's say Lens is a protocol that you can build those experiences. Some are more of those end user um, experiences. So, um, and you can see over even in the the social media applications that are have integrated Lens, like Orb or Butterfly, they're constantly coming with with new features and trying to kind of like a find. Um, what might be exciting for their existing uh, users? I do think it's, it's quite early, and I think we aren't in a in a in a uh, state yet where kind of like decentralized social is uh, has a good uh, product market fit. Um, but I do think we do have those ingredients uh, there that we can test, and our goal is that we want to provide the flexibility for developers to actually try new things create new primitives and see how th that actually helps them uh, to create, to, to, to get that product market fit. And also at the same time, be a bit of a bridge and get new users that are not, for example, in the ecosystem yet, because I think that's the bigger goal here. So if we're able to capture new users into Web3 to new social experiences, that will be amazing because you can come into the space without doing a financial transaction, and that will be quite a big paradigm shift for, for our space. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Danny. 
Um, where can people learn more about Lens and uh, where do they shoot you a DM to kind of get an invite? Yeah, you can uh, you can call lens.xyz and you can join the waitlist. That's that's the most fastest. You can also try and send me a DM in, on Twitter. Uh, if you're already a Lens user, you can follow um, me, Stanley.lens, across all the uh, applications that are integrated uh, Lens. Um, yeah, and be excited to see this podcast also uh, on Lens and, and being able to comment there as well and, and my additional thoughts as well. Yeah, absolutely. I personally am on Lens. Uh, it's my last name dot Lens, but uh, I'm not very active yet. So we'll we'll have to get better here. <laughs> Thank you so much.